All right, the title of my sermon this morning is How to Talk and Listen. How to Talk and Listen. So I like preaching on this every now and then because I, I find it's very practical and you know, it's good to be reminded of the different lessons we have in the Bible, the different principles that the Bible gives us about how to have a godly conversation, how, how we ought to talk to people, how we ought to listen to one another. Now, in my life, I mean, I have lost count of the number of times that, that I have received advice on communication. You know, whether it's at work or even before I was pastoring a church, like, you know, talking even to Mark Tossel about, like, you know, how to talk to people and how to listen to people. And you get it all the time at work. Because any time you've worked long enough in any sort of corporate environment, I mean, there is conflict that goes on uh, within that office, doesn't it? So, you know, you're always talking with your manager. You know, how can you deal with that situation differently next time, you know, maybe don't interrupt as much or, you know, listen, make sure the, the way you talk, you know, you said that, that might have been taken the wrong way. So communication is a big part. And like I said, I've lost count of the number of times I've had conversations about having conversations. And, you know, misunderstanding and miscommunication is issue, are issues that we deal with all the time. Why? Because we live in a world with sinful, fallible people who can't read each other's minds. I mean, if you could read each other's minds, I mean, you can preempt what people are thinking before, you know, they think it, or, you know, you can address those things. So, because we live in an imperfect world with imperfect people, there's always going to be miscommunication. It's good that, you know, the Bible gives us principles on how to communicate, how to talk, how to listen, so it can give us some guidance on how we go about our conversations. Look at, look, look at what Proverbs 10, 19 says. It says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin. So you see, when there's a lot of words spoken, the Bible's saying here, there's no, there's no, there's, there's no lack of sin. Right? There's, there's wanteth not sin. There's no desire for sin to be there. Because whenever there's a multitude of words being spoken, there's probably sin being committed too. Right? The more words that are spoken, the more sin there is that can be committed with our words. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. So sometimes when you don't speak, when you choose not to participate in a conversation, it can be a wise thing to do. Now maybe you think I'm preaching this today because of you. And that just proves my point, that you know, it's a very practical thing. Because there's probably few of you in the room that are thinking, oh, is Victor preaching this because of me? But you know, it's, you know, maybe I am. Well, I, guess you, I guess you'll never know, right? <laughs> But what my point today is, I just feel like this topic is always something that's very practical. Not even for myself, it's a good reminder for me, but it's always a good reminder every now and then because, you know, this is the world we live in, right, where we are talking a lot. You know, we talk a lot with people and it's always a very practical subject. And you can save yourself a lot of strife if you learn some godly principles for communication and strive to do them, not only in your personal life, you know, but also in church as well. Look at what it says here in Galatians 5. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Look at this. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed. And like notice, we're not actually physically doing it, right? You're not actually physically eating each other up. So it's the way we treat one another. It's the way we talk to each other. But if we bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So, you know, not try, if we don't all strive to follow these principles, we can have a lot of issues, not only in church, but a lot of issues even in your personal life as well, you know, the way you go about communicating with people. So this is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about some principles, how to talk, and we're going to talk about how to listen. So it's going to be both sides, because obviously a conversation is, is a two-way communication, isn't it? So we don't only want to know how to speak to people, we also want to know how to listen as well. Now, the reason why I really love, when I talk on this topic, going to Joshua 22, is because Joshua 22 is like a really good example in the Bible of miscommunication happening. And you can see in this passage, if you don't know what's going on here, just to give you a bit of context on what's happening, 
If you remember, when the children of Israel were going into the land of Canaan, into the promised land, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh, they decided, you know what, rather than inheriting land over on the other side of the River Jordan, they said, hey, this land over here is already nice. You know, we can start building things and, you know, we, we would rather inherit land on this side of the Jordan River rather than on the other side of the Jordan River. And the first, when they said that, the, 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 the heads of Israel said, you know, you can't, you can't settle here and build houses and, and your brethren go into war, you know, and you, you settle here. So they said, no, 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 we're not, we're not going to not go into war with them. We'll, we will build houses and we'll set up our stuff here because that's what we're going to inherit if, you, if we're allowed to inherit on this side. But we will still go into war with our brethren to claim the inheritance and then when all the wars are finished, then we'll go back. So this is what you see here. We're at the end of Joshua. All the fighting is done. They've claimed the land of Canaan and now they're going back over to Jordan. Now God had a rule that, hey, you can't just worship God wherever you want. You know, that's why you had a tabernacle. Right now, the capital city here is in Shiloh. So the tabernacle is in Shiloh, and that's where they were to bring their offerings and to offer burnt offerings and peace offerings and all that sort of stuff. They couldn't just offer them anywhere. anywhere. So what does Reuben in this story, what do Reuben and the children of Gad and Manasseh do? So where they crossed over the River Jordan, they decided, you know what? When we cross back over on our side of the River Jordan, we're going to build an altar you know, to the Lord. Now, when they start seeing them build that altar, they're asking, what are you doing? Like, why are you building this altar? Don't you know you're only meant to offer sacrifices in one place? So this is why if you're wondering, why were they so upset when they heard that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and Manasseh were building this altar because they were only allowed to offer offerings at, certain, at a certain place that God had appointed? And obviously, if they did it somewhere else, they would, then they would bring wrath on the whole congregation of Israel. So we see here in Joshua 22, verse 10, And when they came unto the borders of Jordan, that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben. So you see they're hearing, Hey, they're building this altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. So what's this first problem here? This first problem here is they're not thinking about why, why are Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh doing this? And what do they do? The first thing they assume is ill intention, don't they? So the first thing, they're assuming ill intention. And, lo and look, when they go to approach them, it's not an attitude of, hey, let's go and see why they're doing this. Let's hear them out. Let's see what their point of view. Let's, let's hear the matter first before we respond. No, here is, what's their initial reaction? To go up to war against them. So when they go to approach their brethren here in the nation of Israel, Reuben, Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, they are already ready to fight. Now, that's, that's something that we can learn as well in our own lives. You know, when we go into a conversation, are we more ready to hear or are we just going in ready to accuse, ready to fight, ready to, to go to war in a, in a spiritual war of words when we talk to people? Joshua twenty two sixteen, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord in that ye have builded you an altar, that ye might rebel this day against the Lord. See, sometimes when people disagree on things, or they have a difference of opinion, one is, you know, you see here that when they go in, I mean, have they even asked the question yet of why they are building this altar? No, they go straight in, and as soon as you see they go straight in, they're already accusing them. Hey, why are you committing this trespass? And sometimes you even see that in conversations amongst Christians, right? When you disagree, it's, hey, it's, you don't care what the Bible says, you're not following the law, you, you, just, you just want to justify your sin. You know? So it's like you can see this here as well. It's like they just go in and they're already on the attack. The accusations are coming. Hey, you're rebelling against the Lord. There wasn't that attitude of going in and hearing first. Joshua 22:17. Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us? 
from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of Israel. So you can see, that's why I love this passage. I just feel like this passage is just so similar to just every verbal conflict that you know about. Like, you know, people, they, they go in, they're accusing, they start comparing them to other bad things, so they're comparing them to other issues, things that are going wrong. But that you must turn away this day from following the Lord. It will be seeing you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Now, here as well is a point that notice, like, did, did the other ten tribes, so you think it's ten tribes with the half-tribe of Manasseh, because you've got Reuben and Gad and a half-tribe of Manasseh, did the ten tribes that came with Phineas, did they have, they, they don't always have bad intentions. Right? So just, you, you can have good intentions, but still go about talking and listening the wrong way. Right? Because you can have good intentions, like, hey, you love the Lord, you want to do what's right, you, you also, you know, because you know, sometimes when people, you know, clash, I mean, think about this whole coronavirus thing, right? You know, you, you want to, you know, take a stand, you want to stand against, what do people say? Ah, oh, you're just selfish, you don't care about yourself, you know? So it's the same with this. I mean, yeah, it's like, well, we're not selfish because we care about the people whose rights are being taken away. So it's not that both sides, are, uh, one side's being selfish and one side isn't, but it's the same. People can have good intentions, but that doesn't mean they go about it the right way. And it's the same here. You know, tomorrow he'll be worried. So what are they worried about? They're worried about the wrath of God coming on the congregation of Israel. So they have the right motive, the right intention, but that doesn't mean they went about it the right way. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto to the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth. So what are they saying here? They're basically saying, look, if you're building this altar because you, know, you think, hey, where you are is unclean, then come and possess the land on this side of Jordan. You know, you, you guys were the ones that wanted to settle on that side. Right? So they, again, they, they, they haven't listened to why they're doing these things, they're accusing them, hey, and they're starting to now assume why they're doing these things. You know, they haven't even heard their point of view yet. Did not Achan, and again, they're, they're comparing him to another sin that happened in the congregation as well. Now, in verse 21, this is where we see the response from Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. He said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know, if it be in rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord. Now, this I always think, yes, it is true that even though other people may not know your intentions and may not know your heart, but one thing you can be sure of is God knows. Now, this can be both a comforting thought and also a fearful thought too, <laughs> right? Because if you have the right intentions, the right heart, that's comforting to know, hey, you know, even if people misunderstand me, even if people accuse me of something I don't, hey, God knows, like here, yeah, God knows what I'm trying to do, and God knows that my heart is right with him. But if you don't, you should also fear that, yeah, God knows what you're trying to do. So, you know, this is why, this is like a double-edged sword, isn't it? Where God knows, and that's why they say, hey, God knows if it's in rebellion or if transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. So saying, hey, we have truly done it to rebel against the Lord, then, you know, you're justified in coming and warring against us and taking our lives. That, that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require us. He's saying, hey, if we have actually transgressed against the Lord, then yeah, let the Lord re require it. Let him seek vengeance. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing. So now they're explaining, hey, what is the reason behind their actions here? Saying, in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? So I won't read the whole passage for sake of time, but basically what is happening here, they then explain, hey, the reason why we have built this altar, it wasn't for the purpose of actually sacrificing burnt offerings on it. It was if in time to come, in the future, your children say, oh, because you settled on the other side of the Jordan River, you don't have any part with us. That there's a similitude of the altar to say, hey, you know, this is a, it's something to remember that we 
are, you know, part of the nation of Israel and we can go and offer so that you can't hinder our children from coming into Shiloh and offering before the tabernacle. So what was the conclusion of this? And when Phinehas the priest and the princes of the congregation and heads of the thousands of Israel which were with him heard the words that the children of Reuben, the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. Right? So they go away happy. So then you think in this situation, if they had just come, because you know, it's hard to take words back. Right? So, so you say, say the ten tribes came and they had this attitude at the beginning. Hey, why don't we hear the words that the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh speak before we cast an accusation? Then they might have just come and been pleased and left. You know? But now you think maybe there might be a bit of bad blood now between the ten tribes. Even though they understand and it pleased them, you wonder, was there some bad blood? You know, maybe there were some Reubenites and some Gadites and some Manassites going, yeah, you know, they were happy, but how dare they say those things about us, you know? Who knows? But like I said, you know, when you, when you say things, it's very hard to take them back. So we have to be careful with how we talk. And obviously, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect either. You know, that's why sometimes, like, you know, when I think of these, these are lessons that I've learned in my life and also that I, all, I need to be reminded of too because, you know, even myself, you know, I find myself saying things I ought and I ought not and getting myself into trouble in uh, situations where, you know, if I had taken my own advice, <laughs> I wouldn't have got into it. All right, James 3. Let's first talk about how to talk. So we're going to talk about how to talk first and then later on we're going to talk about uh, principles on how to listen. James 3 is a very famous passage because it talks about the tongue. You know, not just the actual organ itself. You know, like the kids learned this morning, you know, you have the actual organ, the tongue, and if you're wondering why the kids have this uh, little red thing sitting on their head, today we did Acts, and that was the day of Pentecost. So that's the tongue that was sitting on top of them. And I was discussing this, Phil, I'm going to be on a bit of tangent here, but you know that tongue, a, a lot of the times... I think there's a misconception with what happens in the book of Acts. And oftentimes when you see it animated, they're in the upper room and you have the rushing mighty wind and, and you imagine, you probably imagine yourself that when they're praying in that upper room, it's like, it's like in the movies, it's like things start blowing around. It's like, Whoosh. But if you actually read the passage, there wasn't actually a wind that came into the room. It was just this, the sound of a rushing mighty wind. So the sound of a rushing mighty wind came from heaven and the sound filled the room. So I don't actually think the room, everything was like blowing around and like it was just like, oh, it was just something really noisy that was happening. And then normally when you see like the fire sitting on top of each of their heads, that's what you would imagine, right? You think, hey, then there was a flame sitting on top of their heads. But if you actually read the passage, what's actually sitting on top of their heads, it says it sat upon them cloven tongues like as of fire. So the way I've always understood that it's just not a flame actually sitting on top of them. It was actually a tongue on top of them, a cloven tongue. So a cloven tongue is like a forked tongue, and the forked tongue was moving like a flame. That's how I, was, I always imagined it. So it's actually a tongue sitting on top of them. But anyways, the tongue, so we're talking about languages. Here, when we're talking about the tongue, we're talking about what the tongue does, right? The tongue allows you to talk. So the tongue can cause a lot of damage. Look at what it says in James 3. My brethren... Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So you see, we have to be aware that if we put ourselves up as teachers, we need to be aware what we communicate, right? Because the more people we teach, the more people we can upset. Verse 2, that's what it says here. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So the body, the, the Bible saying here, if somebody could control their tongue perfectly and not sin with their tongue, the Bible says that person is also perfect. <laughs> That's how hard it is to, to tame your tongue, right? I mean, the tongue also directs the whole body, which is what James is talking about. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us. So your bit, that's like the bit you put into the horse's mouth to control the horse. And we turn about their whole body. So saying, with that thing in the horse's mouth, you can control the whole horse. And you think about how strong a horse is. That's why they use horses in riots, you know, and to control like those protests as well. 
Why do they have these horses? Because horses are so strong and they're so big. They just put a horse in between you and somebody else and, you know, people don't cross that line. But you can control a horse with just something in the horse's mouth. And the Bible's saying here, that's how important your mouth is, that you can control your mouth, you can control your whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm. You think about where the steering wheel is in a big ship, and that small steering wheel can turn about the whole ship. Whithersoever the governor listed. So this means wherever the governor desires. Right? It's, it's following after that word lust, like what G Jesus says in John 3, the wind blows where it listeth, wherever it desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So the Bible's telling us that the tongue, our words, is like that spark that can cause a huge fire to occur. And you see that. This is how rumors work. This is how gossip happens. You know, a secret. One person tells this, and tells this person. And you know, this is why things go viral, right? People spreading it around. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our, among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. It is set on fire of hell. What I want you guys to take away from this passage is, you know, it's not that, it, this is not a sermon to say you never talk again. And not that you can't talk about, you know, things that are even controversial. What I want you to take, what I think we should take away from this passage is you need to realize how dangerous words can be, right? How dangerous the tongue can be. And if you internalize that and think, oh man, my words can have a really big effect, you'll just be more careful with words. I mean, are we not careful with knives? Are we not careful with fire because you know the danger that fire can create right and if you understand that your tongue is like a fire and not just any fire it's like set on fire of hell right you will be more careful with how you go about your speech how you go about your communication that's what you want to take away from this passage it's like man the tongue is such a dangerous thing man i ought to take care with how i use it for every kind of beast, verse 7, and of birds and of serpents and of things of the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is, unruly, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And people have tamed. They have tamed all sorts of animals. You think about they tamed elephants. And people tamed tigers and lions. So, you know, people tamed bears, all sorts of things. And the Bible says, hey, the tongue is even more dangerous than that you know some people say things like you know sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me and i think people say that to themselves you know because yeah you can get to a point where you can resist words being said to you right so you want to understand when people say sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me that doesn't mean words have no effect on people words can hurt Right, and we'll sh show a couple of verses here. So people, just remember, people say that because they're saying, hey, I'm not letting words affect me. You can grow to the point where you say, hey, I'm not hurt by the words people say. But what it doesn't mean is that words don't hurt people. You know, only physical things hurt people. Words can hurt more so than a physical ailment. Right? Look at what the Bible says here. Proverbs 18, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity but a wounded spirit who can bear. Now when we talk about our, how do you wound a spirit? How does somebody's spirit get wounded? Remember we talked about what is spirit? Words are spirit. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. So when we're in this spiritual battle, we use the word of God. So how does a spirit get wounded of a man? Well, it's the things they listen to, the things people say to them. You know, this is why I think doctors are very careful about discouraging people that are sick because, you know, it's this, this principle of, hey, if somebody's sick and they have the right attitude, right, their spirit is healthy, that can, that can sustain them. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? Somebody who's given up, somebody who's discouraged, you know, it's hard, even though they're maybe physically healthy, 
physically fit, if their spirit is wounded, it can disable them, right? What are the things that are said to them? Proverbs 18, look at this. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. <laughs> so notice, you would think, like most of us would think, like going to war, fighting spiritually, overtaking a castle would be a very difficult task. And the Bible says here, hey, it's actually harder to win somebody back that you've offended than it is to overtake a city. I mean, think about the, the, the analogy that, the, that God is giving here to, tell, to show us how important it is, you know, when we, when we deal with one another, how we talk to one another, right? Proverbs 18, look at this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So there was three negative ones. I'll show you one positive one. Look at this in Proverbs 16. Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. So not only you can see a lot of destruction can come from the wrong words, right? Wrong words spoken at the wrong time or maybe spoken in the wrong way, but also pleasant words, the opposite. Right? So this is why it's important that even when you, know, when you talk to your kids, you talk to other people, that you don't, it's not always negative. You, know, you give praise and negative, right? Because good words, pleasant words can also help people. They can pick people up. Sweet to the soul. So not only spiritually, right, it can help them and pick them up, but look, it can also affect people's physical health, health to the bones. Right? So notice that the words that are spoken have a physical effect on people as well, not only a spiritual effect. So that's one principle there. You know, the tongue, it can do a lot of damage. Let's look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 14. It says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleight of men and cunning craftiness where they lie, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now what I want you to take away from Ephesians 4 is when it says here, but speaking the truth in love. Now, some people have the attitude, and this is the wrong attitude, that, you know, you just speak the truth and it doesn't matter how you say it, it doesn't matter how it comes across, I'm just going to say the truth and they can just deal with it. Now, are, are you going to get people upset sometimes unintentionally? Yeah, of course. Because sometimes when you, even if you speak the truth in love, people are going to get upset. People aren't going to like what you say. Sometimes it's inevitable. What, what I'm talking about here is not never offending somebody, what I'm talking about is the attitude in which you talk, is there an intention to offend? Is there an intention to try not to offend? That's what it means by speaking the truth in love, that it's not just important what you say, but it's also important how you say it, right? So what you say is important, but also how you say it is important as well. And these are things that we have to think about. So not only... Speaking the truth in love, but verse 16, look what it says here. From whom the whole body fitly joined together. I know the context here is about building and edifying one another, but what I want to take away from verse 16 is, hey, it's all, all of our, all of us play a part in creating the environment we have here, creating the community we have here. Whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supply, according to the effectual, effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So we can all play a part in building this culture, building this attitude of speaking considerately, speaking with love. So not only what you say, but how you say it. Ephesians 4, later on in the chapter, verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And notice how that ties in sort of with Ephesians 4 verse 16, where what the Bible's telling us here is obviously corrupt communication, you know, the sort of bad speech, 
that you think about. You know, it could be like using profanity, speaking disrespectfully, all these sorts of things. Rather than speaking that way, it's saying, hey, think about the way you speak. Is it edifying? Is it good to the use of edifying? What does it mean to edify? It means to build people up. How is it encouraging? Because it's helping somebody that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Colossians 4. Look at this. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Like This is one I always think of when I think of how to go about speaking with people, right? And how to even share truth with people. Because some people, they're so, and, and this happens a lot with new believers, right? So if you're a new believer, obviously you're very excited about the truth. You want to tell people, you know, what the truth is. But tr truth, tr so the salt here represents truth. And know that salt can make things taste good, but too much salt can make things taste bad. And salt can also be an abrasive as well. So notice what this passage is saying here. It's saying, let your speech be always with grace. So it should always be graceful, it should always be considerate, it should also always be respectful, always be giving people the benefit of the doubt, and it should be seasoned with salt. So when you think about when you're trying to share a truth with somebody, how do you go about it? You want to season your speech with salt so that it's palatable, it's easy for them to take, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. But I think about how a lot of like a lot of new believers go about this, right? It's just all truth. Now, just think of, you want to compare this to preparing a meal. If I had to cook a dinner for somebody and I just gave it all like 90% truth, I mean, are they going to receive that food? So when you're thinking about how you talk to people, you've got to think about it the same way that if I was preparing food for people. If I want to prepare food for people, I want to make it taste good. I want them to enjoy eating it. So it's the same with your speech. The best you can. You season it with salt so that it tastes good and then they're more likely to receive it. So let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. It's not always with salt, seasoned with grace, right? It's the other way around. It's always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now let's go on to a different passage, right? So like I said, you want to think of your communication like cooking. How can you make it tasty? You know, how can you make people like talking to you? You know, it's like, you know, you probably have people in your life where there are people that you enjoy talking to and then you have people you don't enjoy talking to. You know, and the difference is, well, somebody, you know, their speech is probably more palatable for you to take and others, you know, it doesn't taste so good. So, you know, what you want to focus, because right now we're focusing on how to talk. Focus on making your speech more palatable for the other person. And then, you know, people will obviously enjoy talking with you more. Proverbs 15, verse 1 and 2. Look at this. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. See, so what you want to see there in verse 1 is, see, your speech can not only be escalate, can not only escalate issues, right? So sometimes when people speak, they escalate situations, but the way you talk can also de-escalate issues. Right? So a soft answer turneth away wrath by grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So what is it saying here? There is some restraint even from people that have knowledge. Right? So the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. So you see how there is a way to go about using the knowledge that you have. It's not just being like a fool, right? A fool, it's just everything that's in their mind. There's no filter between, it's like kids, right? Kids don't have any filter between their brain and their mouth. It just, as soon as it appears here, it comes out here. But this is not what the, that's the fool, right? The mouth of fools is poureth out foolishness, right? We need to develop like a Christian filter between our brain and our mouth that, that says, hey, you know, am I, uh, considers these principles and runs our speech through these principles and the Bible says in verse 2, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. Uses knowledge in a right way. So there's a right way. That means, that means there's a wrong way to use knowledge. Notice that. See, if there's a right way to use knowledge, that means there's also a wrong way to use it as well. So there's a, even though it might be right, the right thing that you're saying, it may not be the right time, it may not be the right person, it may not be the right um, you know, way that you're saying it. 
Right? So these are all things to consider. Look at here where it says in 2 Timothy 2 about the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them ret- repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Um, this is a verse that was always taught to me, you know, preparing for the ministry, preparing to be a leader, to say, look, this is how you should deal with people. You know, and this is a problem in the independent Baptist movement as well, you know, that leaders deal with people the wrong way. They're very harsh on people, very aggressive, you know, very, you know, rebu- always rebuking them, you know, rebuking them, things like that. And there's a place for that. But this was always a good reminder because the Bible says, hey, you're gentle unto all men. So the way we go about it, like Jesus with his disciples, with Je- well, you know, because people will try and use Jesus to say, oh, yeah, look at how he dealt with the Pharisees and look at, yeah, well, yeah, he, that's how he dealt with the unbelievers. You know, you can get un, you know, but when you're, he's dealing with his followers, he was gentle with them. When they, when they doubted him, I mean, think about doubting Thomas. I mean, Jesus didn't just like rebuke him in front of everyone, make him feel silly. You know, he was gentle with him. He cared for him. He loved him. So it's the same here, you know, gentle unto all men. And all of us are leaders in our own, right? So we want to follow the principles that God has set forth in terms of leadership in meekness, right? So there's some humility here. There's knowing your place. There's knowing your own faults as well. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance and acknowledging of the truth. And sometimes the way I know in my own life as I've matured as well, like the more, the more you grow and the more you realize your own weaknesses and the more life experience you get, you tend to deal more gently with people because you now have a bit more compassion, a bit more empathy, a bit more understanding about the struggles that people can have. Whereas sometimes the hallmark of a new believer is they have no compassion on people's situations. It's just like, no, it must be like this, and that, and then if they don't, yeah, that's just because they don't care about the things of God, and I think that's a hallmark of a new believer, right? But, but, but an older believer goes, you know what, I understand situations are not always that clear cut, you know, there, there are probably complexities and struggles that, you know, I may not have even experienced in my own life, and that teaches you to be gentle and meek, right? Some humility on, you know, being gentle with people. So not only, you know, that, you know, being gentle, let's look at, some, let's look at one more before we go on to how to listen. I've got a few there. First Timothy 5. It also can be, you know, different people are treated differently as well. So sometimes you can't always talk to everyone in the same way because it depends on your relationship with them. It depends maybe if they're older or they're younger than you, how well you know them. And we can see here in 1 Timothy 5, we get a bit of insight in, hey, different people in the church, their age, their gender, you might deal with them differently. 1 Timothy 5, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. So you can see the older people, you may not joke around with them and speak to them so forwardly as somebody who may be your own age or younger. So when we speak to older people, we want to show them some respect. You don't just tell them off straight away, especially if they're older. You may be a bit more gentle with them. So the Bible says, hey, you rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. So the same way, you know, this is, you, you think about sometimes, you know, you, you wouldn't dare rebuke somebody older, you know, that you don't know. And this is what the Bible is saying. Because the Bible is assuming here that you treat your father with respect, right? But in the day and age we live in, it's like the other way around. Like people, they, 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 they mouth off at their parents and they mouth off at their father, but then they show people they don't know respect. And the Bible's saying here, hey, younger people, and especially children, you're meant to honour your mother and father, and then that honour is meant to extend onto people that are older than you, right? And the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger sisters with all purity. So, hey, you treat different people differently. Depends what your relationship is. You know, are you good friends? Are you older? Are you younger? And these principles, you know, you can apply these as well when you're trying to share the gospel as well. So this is, these principles are not just about your workplace, not just about within church, but also when you're trying to preach the gospel to strangers as well, people you don't know. You want to use these same principles principles because you know zeal is good but it needs to be controlled just like a flame just like the fire of your tongue it's good to be passionate and to be hot but if you're not careful if it's not controlled it can do a lot of damage you know especially with unsaved people you know and and young christians especially need to learn this all right i've just got three when it comes to how to listen we'll go through these quickly so we talked about how to talk here are some principles on how 
to listen because obviously communication is a two-way street. And if either one of these people apply these principles, there will be peace, you know, amongst, you know, that, that conversation. So even though it's a two-way street, I think, I believe, if at least one of the people is applying these principles, there will always be peace. What happens when people conflict is because two people, both are not applying these principles. Now, ideally, both people apply these principles, and that's what we want to seek for. First one is Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, so my question here is, you know, are you easily offended? You know, are you the sort of person that gets upset easily? Something happens, oh, I can't believe they did, how dare they do that? You know, you get upset easily, take things personally. Hey, this can definitely affect your conversations. You know, if you're listening in a way where everything they say, they get offended. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, that, that comedy show, um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Does anyone know that show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? <laughs> you, remember, you remember how they had that bit where like, they're improvising and, and the whole, the, the comedy was every time somebody says something, then that person has to pretend like, you, what did you mean by that? You know, they get really offended. It's like, you mean this? You mean this? I can't believe you said that. And then they're like, no, I meant this. And then they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Go on. Um, so whenever I think of getting offended, I always think of that, that bit with whose line is it anyway. So are you somebody that is easily offended? Are you like that? Are you like, a, like they talk about the snowflake generation? You like melt really easily. It's just like a touch and you're already melting down. You know? And see, if you are, if you, see it says here, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. So notice when the more spiritual you get, the harder you are to offend. So if you are somebody that's very easily offended, very easily upset with people, that shows a lack of spiritual maturity because as we grow in our faith, less things should upset us. You know, great, it's a great, and, and if you get upset really easily, it's a great way to have no true friends, right? Because true friends should be able to talk to you and if you get upset all the time, you know, they're not going to want to open up because they're always going to be worried you know, about upsetting you. I mean, if you know somebody in your life that is really offended really easily, I mean, you always feel like you're treading on ice around them. You're treading on this fine wire. And then, you know, can you really be open and honest with them if you're worried about them getting upset, the way they react? Proverbs 27, look at this. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So you see, we need to be people that are not easily offended, that are willing to hear people out understand the other point of view. I mean, this is one key to not being offended is if you try and give people the benefit of the doubt and you understand, you try and understand where they're coming from rather than, like in Joshua 22, immediately assuming the worst, immediately assuming that they have ill intention. See, so if you want real friends, then you have to be willing to not be offended so easily. Here's James 1. Here's a great principle when it comes to listening. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So when we think about, hey, what should we do first? I know I talked about talking first, but if we have the two, how to talk, how to listen, what is actually should come first? Let every man be swift to hear, Slow to speak, slow to wrath. So the first thing we should be trying to do is hearing first, understanding the other point of view. You don't want to immediately get offended or angry. And if you're quick to speak, you're quick to wrath, it's because you've been slow to hear, right? So give people the benefit of the doubt that they're not just saying things to upset you, right? And you want to, be, you want to hear them out first. Look at what it says in Proverbs 18, 13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And like in Joshua 22, didn't we see that the ten tribes of Israel, they kind of made a fool out of themselves, didn't they? They came up, you can imagine, right? They didn't just go and ask them, you can imagine, because they went up to war against them. So it's like, it's like ten tribes go away, they all get geared up, they're all coming in, their shields and swords and everything, and it's like, oh well, we didn't even actually have to fight. So 
Sometimes it's like that in your own life. You overreact, you know, when you answer a matter before he heareth it. He that answers, that means you answer, you respond before you actually understand what you're responding to. And the Bible says here, it is folly and shame unto him. It makes you look stupid at the end of the day. Right? So, you know, you listen to understand. Right? And you're not just, you know, you're not just waiting your turn to talk. You know, some people, you know, when you're listening, you don't want to get in the habit of just like waiting to respond. And I do that myself. Now, this is something I really, sometimes, and sometimes you realize you're not actually listening to somebody, right? Because you're actually formulating your own response, right? So you're formulating your response and then you're like, and that's why sometimes you see me in interviews and I just like not answering even the question because like I'm like trying to think of like what to answer and then they're saying some things and then I completely miss it. And I have to remind myself, I, I should actually listen, make sure I understand the question and then, and then respond. Uh, so you're not just... Um, so don't just think about what they're saying as well. But you want to understand why they're saying it, right? When you're swift to hear and slow to speak. And you want to realize, hey, and it's, not, it's not just the words people use. Sometimes it's what they mean by the words that they use. So sometimes you have to ask questions, you have to clarify. These things are very important. And this helps you not to answer a matter before you hear it. Because you know what? If you assume, you know, we've all heard the joke, how do you spell assume? It's when you make an ass out of you and me. Right, so when people assume, you may end up looking foolish. And I think it's, you know, it's actually rooted in some truth. Because if you answer a matter before you hear it, you're assuming things and it makes you look like an ass. Last one, Proverbs 29. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? Look at this. There is more hope of a fool than for him. You know, when I read through these verses, it's just like so many memories come flooding back because of like, you know, these verses have been told to me so many times. And, um, you know, I, obviously, you know, I'm like a person that is not, you know, not one that is lost for words either, right? So when I read these verses, you know, these are good reminders and good warnings for me too. And it says, hey, look, if you're a man that's hasty in the things that you say, man, a fool has more hope than you do. Right to be spiritual. Uh, that's uh, that's how I, I sort of understand it anyway. So hey, we need to take these to heart. Take these principles to heart. And, hey, we need to be very careful with things we say. So just a couple of closing thoughts. Hey, when you hear sermons like this, and these are very practical sermons, and this is why I, I I always love this sort of topic because it always applies to everybody. But you know, when you hear sermons like this. You need to always think, hey, apply the sermon first to yourself before you apply it to somebody else. You, know, you may be thinking of somebody and thinking, oh, yeah, that person at work, you know, if they did that, yeah, then I wouldn't get up so, so, so easily. But rather than thinking, hey, I wish this person applied these principles to them, always think first, hey, how can I first apply these principles? It's like we talked about, hey, if at least one person applies these principles, you can have peaceful conversation. Ideally, both people apply these principles. Not only that, if you apply these principles, you'll be a more effective communicator and you'll have less strife and more understanding in your life. So I hope those, this is a good reminder today and I hope these things uh, help you as you go about your day in communicating. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, Lord, uh, sometimes I'm just uh, like really... Um, you know, when I think about how many warnings you give us about our speech, that sometimes, Lord, we're just so flippant about, the, about what we say and how we deal with people. Uh, Lord, I just uh, thank you for the reminder today, uh, not only in the church, Lord, but also just how we deal with people out and about at work. You know, I'm sure that some people think, oh, you know, at, at church I put on my Sunday face and I'm all nice to each other, but then they don't take these principles into their workplace. They don't take these principles when they talk to their family, when they talk to people they know. And uh, Lord, I've definitely been guilty of that. So I pray, Lord, and I just ask you to help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.